So how did the Christian belief system change from polytheism to monotheism? Well, polytheism is the belief in multiple gods and monotheism is the belief in one single God. Canaanite polytheism. What is Canaanite polytheism? Well, Canaan was the name of a large and prosperous ancient country, at times independent and at others a tributary to Egypt, located in the Levant region of present-day Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Israel. It was also known as Phoenicia. The ancestors of those who called themselves Jewish were not much different from Canaanite neighbors. Most notably, they believed in many gods. And the proof of this is in the Bible. Ezekiel 8.14 Then he brought me to the entrance, and I saw the woman sitting there, mourning the god Tammuz. Judges 10.6 The Israelites served the Baals and the Asterisks, and the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. 1 Kings 19.18 Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal. So you have to read that scripture carefully. What that scripture in 1 Kings is saying is that only 7,000 Israelites don't worship Baal. Okay? And if you don't know what Baal is, Baal is an ancient god worshipped in many ancient Middle Eastern communities, especially among the Canaanites, who apparently considered him a fertility deity and one of the most important gods in the pantheon. He was also called the Lord of Rain and Dew, the two forms of moisture that were indispensable for fertile soil in Canaan. But the thing we have to take away from this slide is that only 7,000 Israelites did not worship Baal according to the Bible. But wait, there's more. Polytheism in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 8.5 For even there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords. Exodus 23 Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Joshua 24.2 And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in the old time, even to Ra, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nekar, and they served other gods. Judges 2.13 and they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. So as you can see, there is a plethora of polytheism in the Bible. But this is Old Testament. So understand that the Old Testament was written years before the New Testament. The first book of the New Testament wasn't written until about 70 AD at the earliest. It might have been even later than that. The last book of the Old Testament was written like 300 BC. So these are two separate religious ideologies being merged together. And the earliest ideology was completely different than what we know as Christianity today. So how did it evolve? How did it change? Let's figure it out. So when reading the Bible, if you have read it, I'm sure you've noticed there are plural references to God in the Bible. But why are they plural? For example, in Genesis 126, we read, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Genesis 322 adds, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Why does God refer to himself as us? There's also a grammatical reason that could most naturally explain God's reference to himself as us in Hebrew. There is a feature called the plural of majesty. The plural of majesty was used when a ruler or a king spoke of himself in the plural form in reference to his greatness. Instead of speaking of my rule, a king might speak of our rule over the land, even if he was speaking only of himself. This was common in ancient times. Many Hebrew scholars believe that this is the most appropriate understanding of these verses. God, in his greatness, refers to himself as us, as other rulers did during that time. If this be the case, it proves that the book of Genesis is written solely by humans with no revelation from a God, as God has no reason to have the same grammatical habits of humans during the time. Christians sometimes claim that this is the Trinity talking to himself. That's funny. If either common Christian explanation were the case, you would expect the pattern to continue throughout the Old Testament, but it doesn't. 
It only happens in some of the most earliest writings of the Old Testament. Do they refer to God in the plural form? We know from the Eucharistic text that it was common amongst religions from time to time to have a chief God that was supposedly in charge of a council of lesser gods. A much more plausible explanation is that the plural references in Genesis are remnants of those older polytheistic beliefs, seeing as how they were written around the same time as those beliefs were prevalent among the community. Let's keep it going. Even more plural references to God in the Bible. Psalms 89 verse 5 through 10. The heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God El is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Now that is, is a nail in the coffin right there. And it becomes even more apparent in other scriptures as well. But let's stick with this one for now. Who are these holy ones in the skies that the Bible refers to? Are they talking about angels? Well, in the Hebrew translation, we don't see the Hebrew word for angels, which is malak. Also, an all-powerful God doesn't need helpers if he's all-powerful. Again, it is much more plausible that these passages are remnants of earlier traditions which consisted of divine counsel, like the Canaanite gods which had divine counsels in them. There are other verses which contradict these verses in favor of monotheism, but there are in the very few. These remnants prove that there was a polytheistic belief among the early culture that later editors to the text have skewed towards monotheism, but did not erase the traces completely. Now, as you can see, I've highlighted the word L on this slide. The reason for this is because there is a translation in Hebrew for El. So El was known as the supreme god of the Canaanites in the mythology of the ancient Near East. And he was the father of gods, including by all and men and the creator did. He is sometimes depicted as a bull and known for his tremendous power and strength. Genesis 17, 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. The Hebrew translation for that is El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give you everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you. I will be their God. Now let's go to Genesis 28.3. It says, May God Almighty, in Hebrew translation is El Sadai, bless you. Genesis 48.3. God Almighty, El Sadai, appeared to me. So notice, in the English version, it has been changed to God Almighty, but in the original text, it was written as El Shaddai. What is El Shaddai? Well, El, we already know El is the name of the, the Canaanite God, and it, it's actually the God's name. It doesn't mean just a title God. It was a God named El. And Shaddai is Hebrew for Almighty. So it means El Almighty, the God El Almighty, not just a God. Somehow along the way, um, Christian writers have perverted the word El to mean a title of a God, but it was originally the name, and you can look this up. It was the name of the Canaanite God, El. So let's break down this word a little further, El. The alleged monotheistic God of Christianity is consistently being referred to as Elohim, a plural form of El. So when did Yahweh appear in the Bible? Let's see. Exodus chapter 6, verse 2. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord, and I appeared unto Abraham. Now this is God talking. Unto Isaac and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Yahweh was I not known to them. The traditional view is that the book of Exodus was written by Moses based on the traditional date for the death of Moses. That would mean that it was written around 1400 B.C. However, the view of the biblical scholars now is that Moses did not write and could not have written Exodus. So why would a monotheistic God go by more than one name, especially if he was attempting to teach his people about monotheism? The book of Exodus was already proven fiction by a man named Terence Freedom. Look him up. The story of Exodus 
is the founding myth of the Israelites, telling of their deliverance from slavery by Yahweh, which made them chosen people according to the Mosaic Covenant. Now this, to me, appears to be a sloppy attempt to merge two traditions of El and Yahweh. Over time, the traditions of God El and God Yahweh were fused together and the other gods in the pantheon were eventually discarded and no longer worshipped. So let's look into the incremental merging of El and Yahweh. Writings such as, but not limited to, the Ugaritic text show that attributes of El were fused with attributes of Yahweh and over many generations they became the same God. As the centuries passed, written references to El were modified to make El a more generic term for a god rather than the actual name of a specific Canaanite god. Likewise, over time, we see the writings of Baal transition from Baal being the son of El to Baal being the generic term for any foreign god. Now, the early Old Testament God was not this all-powerful God that we hear about today, and this we can prove with the scriptures. But today, Christians claim that God is all-powerful. So at what point during Christian evolution did God go from not all-powerful to all-powerful? Let's look into the emergence of omnipotence. Judges chapter 1, verse 19. And the Lord was with Judah, and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley, because they had chariots of iron. So basically, um, God couldn't beat these inhabitants of the valley because they had some iron chariots that doesn't sound like an all-powerful God to me yet it's in the Bible 2nd Kings chapter 3 verse 26 and when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him he took with him 700 men that drew swords to break through even unto the kings of Edom but they could not then he took his eldest son that should have reigned in his steed and offered him a burnt offering upon the wall and there was a great indignation against Israel. And they departed from him and returned to their own land. So, in the second Kings, we see the king of Moab at war with the Israelites. Prophet Elijah predicted that the Israelites would defeat the Moabites, if you remember correctly reading the Bible. But the king of Moab sacrifices his son to the god of the Moabites, Chemosh. All right? Look up the god of the Moabites, Chemosh. And the Israelites were defeated. So apparently, the sacrifice to Chemosh was effective. And the Israelite God couldn't beat the Moabites because they made a sacrifice to Chemosh. So, this proves that the Old Testament God could not have been omnipotent. So what was the turning point? When did the Jews go from polytheism to monotheism exactly? So all of the evidence that we've looked at so far suggests that the early Israelites were indigenous Canaanite people. If this is true, it would explain why there is zero evidence for the story of Exodus. It appears to me that the story of Exodus was written to later legitimize claims made by the Jews. But that's a separate topic for a separate video. So stay tuned for my presentation on the Exodus. So what were the historical forces that led to the turning point from Canaanite polytheism to Jewish monotheism? What was going on in the world at the time? Well, right after the golden age of King Solomon, kingdom of Israel was split into north and south, with the south becoming the kingdom of Judah. And in 722 BCE, the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, sometimes referred to as the Lost Tribe because they disappeared from history after that. And in 587 BCE, the Babylonians conquered Judah and enslaved the elite of Judean society. So, the Jews got their ass whooped. The northern kingdom disappeared and the southern kingdom was enslaved. And during this point, some of the Jews that were in exile actually developed a radical explanation for their capture. How and why would God allow it? So, some of them thought that it was punishment by Yahweh. Some of them thought that the Assyrians and the Babylonians were Yahweh's tools. So not only was Yahweh in control of the Israelites, but he was in control of the Assyrians and the Babylonians too. This was a new concept at the time that a God could be in control of other people that didn't adhere to that God. Therefore, if Yahweh was in control of the Assyrians, then he must be their God too. 
And thus we see the emergence of a monotheistic belief of one God rather than many gods. Now I want you to look very closely at these maps. Notice that Egypt is in Africa. Because lots of people today will try to tell you that Egypt is not in Africa. But anytime we speak about Egypt, whether in the Bible or out of the Bible, we're talking about Africans, okay? So all of this stuff is heavily centered around the continent of Africa. Not only the Middle East, which is basically Africa. They just they don't want to call it. It's not, there's no continent called the Middle East, all right? There's Europe. There's Asia, there's Africa, and for some reason, they don't want to call the Middle East Africa. So they just call it the Middle East. But this is Africa, people. Look at Egypt. It's on the continent of Africa. It's right on top of Sudan. All right? Sudan is in Africa, and so is Egypt. And also, take note of the ancient names for these cities and the modern-day names for these cities. We got Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Sudan, Iran. There's our modern day names. And then we have the ancient names, Persia, Palestine, and Edom and such. But notice that this is the same Northern African region. First appearances of monotheism. Now in the year 540 BCE, at the end of captivity, we finally see writings expressing emphatic singularity of a deity. In Isaiah 45, verse five. I am the Lord, there is no one else, there is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know me from the rising of the sun and from the west, that there is no one beside me. I am the Lord, there is no one else. I form the light, I create darkness, I make peace and create evil. The Lord, I do all things. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, there is no one else. Now notice that there is no mention of a devil or an adversary because at this time of these writings, those beliefs had not developed yet. All right. This is why you have to do a comparative reading of the Bible to know when these books were written so you can understand what you read. Hey, if you like this clip, you might want to check out the full length episode. Just click the box on the screen or check in the video description for the link. And while you're down there, go ahead and subscribe. All right, got to go.